This is a time to quell. <laughs> this is a time to quell. Mm. That sweet Yiddish word that means to soak in the deep, sweet delight that comes from witnessing the accomplishment of someone you love. This is, oh, this is a time to quell. <laughs> it is with such delight that we gather together this afternoon in the presence of our beloved Rebbe, Reb Zalman, colleagues, friends, and family to welcome our new Musmachot, Two new rabbis, one new chazan, three new rabbinic pastors <coughs> into our circle, into our circle of colleagues, and into the circle of the lineage of the Zalmans and Aleph's ordinees. This year, our celebration falls on the week of Parshat Bo in which God calls to Moshe, saying, Bo el paro, usually translated, go, go to Pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> but the text does not say, leh, go, but rather, bo, and bo means, um. Um. God called to Moshe saying, come to Pharaoh. So how shall we understand this? And of course, the rabbis respond saying, well, surely this must mean that God will already be there, waiting for Moshe when he comes, echoing God's promise to Moshe at the burning bush. Ki eye imach. I will be with you. This perhaps frames the challenges to you on Musmachot. The challenge of keeping faith that no matter what tasks arise, no matter how hard, that creative, vitalizing source of the cosmos, which we call God, will be there right with you, right beside you. I will be with you. The word smicha itself gives us some insights into how to keep that faith. Sam mem yud chaf e. Smicha. Sam. Well, that's the letter that the whole word smicha comes from. Because that is the letter that means inner and outer support. It's, a, it's the lean on me letter. Reminding you that you can deeply lean on the bank of inner resources and outer support that your life journey has earned for you. Mem, the watery letter says, retain fluidity, do not get rigid. And remember that 15 feet below the surface of the ocean, no matter what tempest rages on the surface, 15 feet below is deep calm. You'll need it. 
Find that inner place of calm and trust it. Yud. Uh, Yud is like the Yah. That pointing hand of God that shows you the way. Bo el paro. Go forward towards the mission that calls your soul. Hear God's voice calling. I will be there with you. Chaf. Chaf is the open hand. The hand that is open to receive and also to give. Reminding us both of our need to offer love, care, and blessing, and also open to receive and thus be nourished and renewed. Hey. Hey is a high five. <laughs> Hey is a life force letter, a letter of breath, twice breathed in the divine name, reminding us that the divine life force is never farther away than our next breath. Samach, Mem, Yud, Chaf, Hey, support fluidity and calm, direction and purpose, giving and receiving, breathing with God. It is to this smicha that God calls a musmachot. It is to this smicha. Support, fluidity, calm, direction, purpose, giving and receiving and breathing with God to which God calls our musmachot. Soon to be rabbinic pastors, Patrice Spitz, Larissa Blechman, Sandra Bortzell, and soon to be Chazen Shulamit Weiss Fairman, and soon to be Rabbi, Elise Saider Joseph, and Hannah Abelman Lehner. Time to fell. <laughs> a time to take a deep, sweet, cleansing breath and beam love. <laughs> a further treat. For today, in addition to honoring a musmachot who have completed this heroic stage of their learning and have come forward to be ordained. We also welcome a musmach, a rabbinic colleague, Rabbi Kevin Hale, who desired to further his learning in such a way that he might earn a second smicha from Reb Zalman and the Alephad. <coughs> this smicha ceremony was held privately a little bit earlier today. And with your permission, I would like to call him up. You have permission. Good. <laughs> I would like to call him up so that he too can speak <coughs> to us and we can honor him as well. What an honor to be here and to be a part of this holy chevra. And I want to start with acknowledgments and first thank the source of time and space and life for uh, creating this very space and time and life and having us all meet together, especially you all, in this particular time and place. Um, I want to give honor, honor to uh, my parents, uh, my mother to blessed memory, my father who at age 90 is vital and about to build his first ukulele. <laughs> My children, Simon and Luna, who challenge me in a way that it's like they're the Rashi, the Rasha at the Seder all year round. <laughs> My wife, Ruth, my friend, who 
has been with me for 20 years on the flow from toy maker to student rabbi to rabbi to Torah scribe to a member of this rabbinic association. And she functions in my circuitry kind of like an old fashioned, I think I got it right, uh, vacuum tube <laughs> that keeps the flow going one way and not the other and occasionally amplifies and occasionally modulates. And I want to give honor to all of my teachers, um, and especially uh, to Reb Zalman, whom I met with after the death of my special teacher, Eric Ray, who I'll speak about in a moment. And I met with him seven years ago uh, to talk about how can I bring my work as a Torah scribe uh, to this world. And the, it ended with a conversation about, would you, would you consider working towards sneaker? And it was my friend Susan Sachs who said, you really ought to do it, but you really ought to talk to Marsha. So I give honor to Marsha, who launched me on this course, and to Daniel, who really led me through it. Before I give honor to my teacher, my, my, the great teacher of, of my rabbinate, my first rabbinate, Eric Ray, I want to give honor to the memory of Michael Teva. He was a dear friend and colleague to many of us. He was the one who uh, introduced me to our teacher, and he was my, my partner in crime as a Torah scribe. And his loss is felt here. Um, he was also one of a small group of rabbis that met maybe 20 years ago and formed what eventually became Ohala. Eric Ray was an amazing teacher. He was six foot four, and I precariously stand on his shoulders as a Torah scribe. He taught me how to repair Torah, how to fix Torah, and he did it with a way that was full of love and humor and made you feel what you should feel, which is that you have a personal, physical relationship to Torah. And his enthusiasm for Torah was infectious. My rabbinate is 15 years old. That's when I first graduated, the term that Reb Zalman used last year, graduated from my rabbinical school. And uh, as I began to work with Torah, it changed. It changed, and I began to question some parts of Reconstructionist theory that supported my rabbinate in the first place. Now, I feel that I need to give blessings to Reconstructionism, and I still am a Reconstructionist rabbi, and the work of Mordecai Kaplan. You can think of Kaplan as the Alta Rebbe of the Reconstructionist world. <laughs> and some of his ideas are so powerful that they make sense in this setting too. That Judaism is a continually evolving civilization, and we here are part of that evolution. That we live in two civilizations, that being Jewish always meant interacting with another culture, another world, another time, another set of ideas and how juicy and challenging that could be. But then there's another idea that I've wrestled with, and it's, this is the third major Reconstructionist idea, that the past has a vote and not a veto. And as I worked as a Torah scribe, following the halachot as I received them from my teacher, I began to feel, no, the past has to have more than a vote. In fact, the present has a vote. The present has a lot of votes. But the past needs to have a veto, which is exercised with great discretion, and only rarely. That sense that we need to keep on being continuous with our sacred past is part of what led me here, and how grateful I am to be part of this heaven. So my first official act as a Aleph ordained rabbi is to bless you all, you beautiful six musmachot. And I have a funny relationship because while they were training for many years, I, was, I wasn't even aware that I was preparing to be an Aleph rabbi. And only in the last year have I been part of it. So um, we're kind of in inverted Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. Well, six. <laughs> so what we share is that we are receiving this incredible, delightful gift and in some sense, heavy responsibility as well on the same day. So this is what we have in common, but there's something different. And the analogy that I bring is that I am like an immigrant. I am like my parents who came from another country. 
And they spent most of their lives here, and they're grateful to have landed on these shores and escaped from Germany. And yet, to the end of my mother's life, and still my father, there's a sense in which he comes from another place. And you are born into this place. So my Christian friends call it a ministry. I will always have two ministries, and some people who have two, one dominates, or they both dominate, I have dual citizenship. And you may envy that I had a previous rabbinic life before today, and I envy that you all are born into this ministry, whatever it may be. So I would like to close with a charge, and I have two charges. One of them is, uh, is, um, is my own, and it's from a sense that we need to keep on being connected with our sacred past and also with Klal Yisrael, the wider Jewish world, which we are part of. Seeing the six of you here reminds me of the first rabbinic ordination I ever witnessed. It was my first year at rabbinical school, and our friend Red Goldie and three other women were ordained, and how proud I was that, in the first time ever, an entire class of women being ordained. And here I am again. <laughs> I'm mindful that in the wider Jewish world, there are those who will look at you and say, women in this position of leadership is not legitimate. Or look at what we do when we come together and say, our way of doing Jewish is not legitimate. In a sense, there's parts of the Jewish world that reject the legitimacy of what we are doing here today. And what I want to say to you is be patient with them and have compassion with them. And don't let that say we are separate, we are still together. And who knows what kind of transformation could take place so that we'll all appreciate it. The second comes from, okay, if Kaplan was the Alta Rebbe of the Reconstructionist world, Ira Eisenstein was the Zeta. And he spoke at my last ordination. And he gave these words of benediction, and I would like to give them to you. And the only difference is that uh, in quoting this verse from Shoftim, uh, he didn't have to convert it so that it was feminine plural. <laughs> There's one line in it that I never quite understood when he refers to the unreconciled heart. So perhaps our first project together as the youngest Aleph Musmahim, Musbahot, excuse me, is that we can figure out what that line means together. And here are the words. Enhance your learning with wisdom, fortify your vision with courage and hope, empower your resolve with the unreconciled heart. Lechu bechochachen zer bechoshaten et Yisrael. Go forth with this your strength and save our people Israel. Amen. Amen. Please turn to page three in your program. And join us in prayerful song. Levavi mikomach ve'atah mikomi. My heart is your place, as you are my place. Join us as we open to further receive the divine presence within us, as surely as we open <coughs> to further receive the divine embrace surrounding us. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. 
Today, we stand before you six women, the Musmachot, the ordinees of the Aleph ordination programs, three, three rabbinic pastors, pastors two, two rabbis, <laughs> one chazan. <laughs> Today, collectively, we are 297 years old. <laughs> We've been in the Olive Ordination programs officially for 33 and a half years. <laughs> Unofficially, 65. <laughs> Today has its own special energy. Here are some gematria, Jewish numerology teachings about this day, as given over by our teacher, Reb Yaakov Gabriel. Today's date, 1 13, 13 has many super cool symbolic representations in it. 1 equals the Creator's oneness. 13 equals Ahava, love, the outer love that we express toward all humanity. The second 13 also equals Ahava, representing the love that the Creator places within us to light and burn with a divine flame. 13 plus 13, Ahava plus Ahava, representing the outer love plus love plus love equals 26, which equals the name of God, yud Hey vav Hey, the goddess that was, is, and will be. One is the Aleph, the unity of God. The gematria of today, the day of our smicha, holds and embraces us invoking blessings for all that we have studied, learned, and shared. May it be so today and all of the days of our lives. Amen. We all had a bat mitzvah ceremony, but only four of us celebrated this at the age of 13. And only one of us was permitted to, wear, to read from Torah at that time. One of us had a bat mitzvah at age 25, with an aliyah to Torah and a talit. One of us was exactly 40 when she read from Torah for the first time. One of us was exactly 50 when she celebrated her bat mitzvah, wearing her very first talit purchased on the Lower East Side of New York. She wept from joy on chanting from Torah. When we light Shabbat candles, all of us usually light too. But one of us lights up to seven on her Kabbalistic candle altar. <laughs> the candlesticks we use come from a visit to Israel to see a daughter who made Aliyah. Special candlesticks brought from Israel by mom. Silver candlesticks from great grandmothers and candlesticks brought to America from Poland by Tante Lina, one of the first in our family to come to America. And one of us uses two beautiful candlesticks that her husband got from a garage sale. <laughs> Our jobs have included hand drummer for dance classes and piano accompanist for a classical ballet company. We've been a bartender, lifeguard, massage therapist, newspaper deliverer, music librarian, protein researcher, secretary in a musical toy factory, house cleaner, hypnobirthing practitioner, and retirement community receptionist. A grocery store cashier, a person who glues labels into sweaters, an educator, a super mom, and a gastroenterologist. <laughs> We've worked on kibbutzim and in health food stores at the Leon Levy Center for Oral Health Research in patisseries and doing door-to-door -door questionnaires. <laughs> We've been energy workers, health workers, breath workers, parking lot attendants, <laughs> visual artists and performance artists, a switchboard operator, 
and a Jewish ritual creatrix. <laughs> Two of us are doulas. <laughs> Two of us flunked out of ballet lessons. <laughs> Two of us have been choreographers. One of us both flunked out of ballet and became a choreographer. <laughs> Two of us were born in Missouri. Missouri. One of us stayed. One of us worked in a coffee shop and doesn't drink coffee. One of us busts dishes at a sushi restaurant and doesn't, doesn't eat sushi. One of us was a waitress at a country club that didn't admit Jews. <laughs> <laughs> One of us was the world's worst waitress. <laughs> One of us is the mother of the world's best waitress. <laughs> Once, one of us purchased 1,000 condoms for distribution and got a rabbi to pay for them. <laughs> Our ancestors come from France, Morocco, Poland, Austria. <clears throat> Czechoslovakia, Russia, Germany, Canada, Lithuania. Ireland, Belarus, and Romania. We all prefer flats over heels. One of us occasionally wears heels when going high femme drag. Some of us are wearing heels today. <laughs> Two, Two of us are fans, fans of, of the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Flyers hockey team. <laughs> he shoots, he scores, and the pucks, pucks drop next week. <laughs> yes. We've been known as Shoo Shoo, Reese Cup, Aphrodite, Shaquinella, <laughs> Wicked Bean, Aunt Lisi, Jesse, Lala, San, Sweets, and Sid the Kid. Schlep, Schlep Captain Kirk, Anna Banana, and Ladybug. <laughs> Before we finished high school, we had started a Wiccan coven, organized a children's anti-war protest, spoke out for civil rights, began meditating, and won an art contest on the very first Earth Day. Before we finished high school, two of us had found our soulmates. One of us met him in third grade. One of us has survived being bitten by a black widow spider three different times. One of us rolled her right foot right over a stretched out rattlesnake and did not get bitten. One of us survived a near drowning in the Wissahickon Creek in Philadelphia. She is, somewhat surprisingly, one of several of us who love swimming and see it as a deep spiritual practice. One of us avoids getting in the water unless the air temperature is over 95 degrees. And even then, generally declining. Our female mentors and role models include our first therapist who introduced us to breath work, grandma who taught us practical things like baking and sewing, and our first modern dance teacher. Our cousin who taught us the word bisexual when we were 14 and helped us to feel normal. Our piano teacher who taught us about truth and beauty. Our grandma who taught us modiani. <laughs> Our mom and her three best friends, who are outspoken and fabulous, and our two grandmothers, who we have been with in many previous lives. Our mother, who taught us the importance of helping and reaching out to others, and the value of a life dedicated to service. Our transpersonal psychology teacher, who taught us about the power and grace of becoming a woman in our full power. Our biology teacher, who researched gender differences in disease. Lucy Ricardo from I Love Lucy. <laughs> Golden Mayer. Madonna. Twyla Tharp. Rabbi Hannah T. Ferret Siegel, Goddess Bless Her. <laughs> we were three boys and six girls. 
one of us helped to deliver her beloved goddaughter. One of us has grandchildren, four of them. We've birthed or co-birthed dance companies, a medical practice, a yoga meditation teaching practice, Jewish communities in Chavarot, minions that met in libraries, in farmhouses, and in yurts, spiritual education programs for children, an expressive arts therapy practice and training institute, and a student government for an ordination program. <laughs> One, thirteen, thirteen. Oneness. Love. Love. Was. Is. Will be. We, we stand, stand before you today, today about, about to, to be birthed, as, as rabbi, rabbi, as rabbinic pastor, pastor, as chazan. <laughs> On behalf of the Musmachot, I welcome all of you to our smicha ceremony. We are blessed by Reb Zalman's glowing presence among us. We are grateful for the love and support of family and friends, teachers and members of the Ba'ad that have allowed us to arrive at this extraordinary day. A special welcome also to those who are watching live on Ustream all around the world. A brief summary of the Torah portion for this week. The scene is, as Reb Marsha began to tell us, that the Israelites, we are enslaved in Egypt, and we are in the midst of the plagues and the dramatic dance between Moses negotiating for us and Pharaoh's heart getting hardened. Parshat Bo includes the three final plagues that God brings on the Egyptians. The eighth plague, locusts, swarm over the land, destroying crops that remain from the plague of hail. After the locusts are removed, Pharaoh again refuses to let the Israelites go free. And the ninth plague, the plague of darkness, descends upon Egypt. Mitzrayim the narrow, constricted place. When the darkness lifts, Pharaoh is even more defiant about not freeing the Israelites, and Moshe warns Pharaoh about the coming final plague, the death of all the firstborn of Egypt. And then a scene change. Torah describes the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people as a nation, the sanctification of Rosh Chodesh, the new moon, the new month. And then, at midnight, the tenth plague strikes, and every non-Israelite firstborn, from animals to prisoners, including Pharaoh's own son, dies. And finally, Pharaoh permits the Israelites to leave Egypt. And Parshat Bo concludes by giving us many commandments, many mitzvot associated with the exodus from Egypt, with our task for liberation. Our first of our Torah is from Hannah Abelman Lehner. The Hasidic masters teach that God's presence, the presence of Hashem, surrounds us at all moments. God is in all of our moments of joy and also in our suffering. When I speak about God, imagine for yourself 
whatever that is for you, however you understand God. That divine mystery, the profoundness that is beyond. As this week's Torah portion unfolds, Hashem commands, Bo el paro, come to Pharaoh. God beckons us to come and enter a place in which we might not expect to find Hashem. It's as if God is saying, come and see me. And when you come to Pharaoh, don't just see Pharaoh as a tyrant, as a ruler. See me inside. I am in the bitterness. I am in the hardships. I am in the narrow places that constrict and enslave. God's invitation bids us to enter the Pharaoh within ourselves, that is in each of us, our own internal struggles, our anger, our loss, our confusion. And as we enter these places that are so difficult and challenging, to seek God's presence in the midst of our hardships, when we're in pain and hurting, it's scary and difficult to enter these places. This invitation is hard to accept. For isn't it human nature to try to avoid pain? I know it is for me. Our minds protect us and they say, don't go there. Yet the more we resist and push away, the larger our hardships loom, and the longer they last. When I'm in the midst of my struggles, I often feel alone. And I'm not always conscious of God's presence with me. I know when I stop that God does not ever abandon me. And deep in my soul, I know that God's compassion is present with me at every moment, even though it's not always obvious. There's a story. The Holy Rishoner Rebbe, the great-grandson of the Magid of Mezerich, taught his students that they should accept all circumstances in life, the good and the bad, and that God is in everything. When the prisoner was in prison, he was weeping. And his students were surprised. They were shocked. They went to him and they said, Rebbe, Rebbe, why are you weeping? You're supposed to accept the hardships. You taught us that God is in everything. And he replied, yes, but when life brings bitterness, we're not only supposed to accept it, we're supposed to feel it. At some point in our lives, we all encounter suffering, hopelessness, or loss. And if we let the intensity of the pain enter us completely, like a sword that cracks our heart open, we can indeed feel the presence of Hashem. In reflecting on my years as a rabbinic student, I have had my own challenges and my own struggles. This has not been an easy path for me. I've had to confront my own limitations, my own behaviors that don't work for me. I've had to look at and face many struggles. And like Pharaoh, my heart has often been tight and constricted. And I've questioned my ability to handle the immensity of what it means to become a rabbi. Like the Holy Rishoner, I felt deeply my doubts and my fears. 
and I've broken down crying in tears. And when I've been in this place, I've found a place that I call the airplane view. And to me, this is the place that hovers over. In an airplane, I can see the whole world. Like from space, we can see the whole world, and everything is connected. There are no boundaries, no borders. <coughs> and from that place, I know that Hashem is with me, even though I don't always understand what is going on. I know that Hashem's compassion and presence is with me. And then I can embrace my challenges as choices and my hardships become my teacher. Fortunately, my path has been also incredibly blessed and inspired by amazing teachers, by Reb Zalman. I walk in the footsteps of my Rebbe's the lineage that goes before me. And I appreciate how much you all have supported me and helped me to stretch to become the rabbi who I long to be. I bless all of you with the ability to welcome the divine presence into the narrow places and also into the wide places of blessing because God is there too. And I pray that as I go forward on my journey as a rabbi, that Hashem's presence will grace me with the strengths and guide me to connect my heart with the hearts of those who seek my leadership and guidance. Amen. <laughs> Larissa Faith Fleckman. Hello, everyone. I want to tell you about some things that I love, just a few things that I love. I love that there's a teaching that says that the Torah that is revealed to a teacher is not only finely tuned to the teacher, but it's finely tuned to those who will hear it. So Torah revelation then is a dynamic process that happens between God and between the speaker or the teacher and between the students or the listeners. So your presence here today helps to reveal all of the Torah that we bring forth. So thank you so much for being here. The Piyasetzner Rebbe offers a simple and very profound teaching on the verse from Parsha Bo that reads, God said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. It's not even really a full verse, it's a sentence fragment. And it appears to be nothing, or maybe, but we know it's not nothing because it's from the Torah. So what is it that is so distinctive about that verse, about that fragment? The Rebbe points out that what is so distinctive it's so remarkable is that God spoke to Moses and Aaron exactly where they were at the moment. They were, and the Israelites were in Egypt, in the narrow place, in the place of enslavement and hardship. God had to speak to them as people who were still enslaved, who were knowing difficulties in order to be heard. The Piazetzner lifts up what those of us who specialize in pastoral care know is our first rule. Go to your patient or client and be there with them. The reminder for me as a rabbinic pastor and as a hospice chaplain is to go to where my people are, to find them where they are, to listen very carefully, and to make sure that my soul is with their soul. The pastoral relationship isn't about the roles that we <coughs> occupy or about what we know intellectually. It's about the relationship. And it's about soul communion and soul connection. In my work as a hospice chaplain, I travel every day, literally and metaphorically. I 
travel all over. I visit patients in numerous places, in hospitals, in their homes, in nursing homes, and even in a jail. Each time I arrive for a visit, I want to listen very carefully so I know where my companion is. And most importantly, so I know where their soul is, and so that I know where my soul is. I don't want to assume that I'm visiting Mexico when in reality I'm really in France. So I've got to stay out of my head and listen carefully. Most often, though, I'm visiting people who feel that they're in Egypt, who feel that they're in Mitzrayim. They are trapped in a narrow place. Often they're trapped in a place where they feel that they have no options and where they often are tightly bound by the constraints of an illness that's probably going to end their life. I arrive in Egypt and I find my people plagued with myriad plagues, with myriad difficulties, some of them eerily reminiscent of our Torah portion, blood and boils, darkness and death, despair, and often they suffer alone, with their hearts hardened and calloused by fear, pain, and exhaustion. My task and my blessing is to walk into Pharaoh's hardened heart with them and to stay there with them while they sojourn there. <coughs> Approaching Parshapo, I'm aware that it can appear that we're in the, we are in the final stages of preparation for leaving, leaving Egypt. It can appear that the exodus is the beginning of the journey, but really it isn't. We are called to remember that the experience of being in Egypt is an elemental part of our journeys. Rav Cook teaches that the memory of the exodus, the memory of Egypt, is etched onto our souls, that we are always to know and remember that place. We are to understand that difficult times are built into the fabric of our lives, but that the possibility for release always exists. With God's help, we'll have soul companionship alongside us to help us through those difficult places. I understand suffering and constriction, most of us do. I've had my fair share. And my suffering burned through me and helped to prepare space within me in which I could hold others. What is revealed to me in a pastoral relationship is revealed because I'm prepared. I'm prepared through education, through my own suffering, and through spiritual practice. I'm prepared to receive and to hold and to be with. And just as you are able to receive our Torah today, I'm able to receive the Torah that is revealed through my patients and clients. I've been sculpted and molded and fine-tuned and stand here as a receiver and a holder and a companion. Much of this work happened within the structure of the Rabbinic Pastor Program. And so I offer deep and grateful thanks to Rep Zalman and to Rabbinic Pastor Shulmit Fagan and to the Olive Seminary for making this program open and available for us and for helping all of us who were chosen to do this work to be here. Thank you.
Sandra Gail Wurzel. Kamayim hapanim lapanim. Ken lev ha'adam la'adam. As face answers to face in water, so does one's heart to another's. Proverbs 27:19. I have been blessed throughout my life to be called in ways that seem mysteriously to weave together, merge, submerge, and re-emerge, like the tenacious, vivacious, sometimes calm, and yet always unpredictable waves of the ocean. Each wave contains particles of joy and triumph, leanings to savor for the future, and bits of detritus from the past, a gentle reminder of my follies and challenges, my humanness. In the majestic spray is a sparkling beacon of light beckoning me, calling me to whom I am becoming and to what I am being called to do. Each wave dying and being born anew the surges bringing inspiration, and the retreats lending me time to reflect on my life and the tasks to be done. Each precious day I am given by the infinite source of creation. In Parshat Bo, Moses is called to be the conduit for God's immense power as a force of life-consuming proportions from the plague of devouring locusts to the plague of impenetrable darkness to the ultimate plague of death to the firstborn of every living thing, from beasts of the field to the firstborn of the Egyptians, including Pharaoh's heir. In one single life, there can occur many little deaths often to make new way for the new to emerge. As we watch in nature over and over again, the cycles of the trees and the plants, budding, blooming, leafing, falling, and dormancy. In my life, I have faced many little deaths of the self. Several of these transformations seemed at the time to be of biblical proportions, not unlike the escape of the Israelites from Egypt and Pharaoh's tyranny. At times, I was unprepared, blindsided, or simply naive. Death can be an actual physical death, such as the loss of a beloved, or a metaphoric death, as in the loss of a dream or one's identity. Both of these kinds of death have been transformative and provocative forces in my life. The Israelites emerged from its writing from the narrow places, escaping the death of their firstborn. A very fine line between death could have prevailed over us, and Baruch Hashem, thank God, it was not us. The fine line between choosing a living death in bondage and a life worth living in freedom. These images offer me a way to reflect on the many narrow escapes and metaphoric deaths I have experienced in my fragile yet buoyant life. Most of us have witnessed or lived through moments of liminal space, a threshold living through the chaos of not knowing, unprepared for what might come, comforted and challenged by what is known or constant. This liminal space, hamakom, the place of creative possibilities where we dream, fret, immerse ourselves in visions and fears, we muck about in the primordial ooze of the mysterious, and either we sink 
remaining captive to our limited perspectives, an insulated place in its rain, or we reach for answers with our resilient selves, finding our potential through presence, through silence, through faith in God, taking the passage to new shores. Nine years ago, like Moses, I encountered a pharaoh in the form of a state legislative board that rendered it impossible for many therapists, including me, to practice psychotherapy in Arizona after 23 years of my doing so. Everyone knows a person or two or an event that has been a pharaoh in their life. Vexing at the time, and dramatically changing the face of the world you know. A phenomenally real and metamorphic experience in one's life. This pharaoh sent me reeling for several years into that chaos of the unknown. Until one day, my heart softened. And I knew what I was being led to do and to become. You witness me here today at the tail end of one very transformational journey and on the precipice of my next adventure. The old selves gently washed pure of their duties, wrapped in beautiful linen and given a kevir, a grave, lined with love, a place in my heart that I will forever cherish as my new self readies for her next calling, a rebirth into unknown lands flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> Patrice Audrey Spence. You'll need to travel light. Take what you can carry, a book, a poem, a battered tin cup, your child strapped to your chest, clutching your necklace in one hot, possessive fist. So the dough isn't ready. So your heart isn't ready. You haven't said goodbye to the places where you hid as a child, to the friends who aren't interested in the journey, to the graves you've tended. But if you wait until you feel fully ready, you may never take the leap at all. And infinity is calling you forth, out of this birth canal, and into the future's wide expanse. From a poem by Rabbi Rachel Barenblatt. In our Parsha, or Torah portion today, we are about to embark on our journey to the Promised Land, which is, in essence, a journey into the unknown. My journey here has similarly been unpredictable and winding, but it has brought me to where I'm supposed to be. About eight years ago, my family and I were living in New York, and while praying and meditating, I came to realize that our next step was to move to a city that I had barely heard of, called Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> Around that time, I also began to feel the calling to enter the Olive Forbidden Pastor Ordination Program. How do we prepare for a journey into the unknown? In our Parsha, God instructs us to make unleavened bread. Why unleavened bread? Lo chametz. Chametz signifies not only leavening, but also the ego being puffed up with ourselves, thinking that we should be in charge. My insight that I was meant to move to Boulder and meant to become a rabbinic pastor grew and grew until I had no more doubts. Yet, it was a daunting step to bring my family to a place where we did not know a soul. And equally daunting to begin a program of intensive study when I thought I was done with school. I vacillated between utter confidence and peace and uncertainty and fear. 
but all the while I chose to bake unleavened bread. Little by little, leaving behind my ego and putting my trust in Hashem, in God, in that deep truth that I was accessing during my prayer time. Rabbi Rachel's poem continues. Learn to improvise flat cakes without yeast. Learn to read new alphabets. Wear God like a cloak and stride forth with confidence. You won't know where you're going, but you have the words of our sages, the songs of our mothers, the inspiration wrapped in your kneading bowl. Trust that what you carry will sustain you and take the first step out the door. <coughs> In the Torah, we receive more directions for how to spend the night right before embarking on our journey. Leil Shimuri Hu Ladonai. It is a night of keeping watch for God. In other words, for God, it is a night of keeping watch over us. God is our Shomer, our guardian, our keeper. God is watching us and guarding us in our tender moments, the times when we feel most vulnerable. Also, Leil Shimurim Huladonai. This also means that before embarking on our journey, it is a night for us to keep watch for God. It is a night for us to listen carefully for the voice of Hashem, to stay connected all through that night of what might be anxiety or misgivings. <laughs> Leaving behind the part of me that thinks I know the answers, listening deeply, keeping watch for Hashem, and knowing that Hashem is keeping watch for me. This is what emboldened me and gave me the strength to go on my journey and arrive here today to receive smicha as rabbinic pastor. May we all keep watch for Hashem, for the voice of wisdom that is inside each of us, and allow that voice to encourage us and guide us on our journey. Elise Seidner Joseph. What hurts you blesses you. Darkness is your candle. Your boundaries are your quest. I can explain this, but it would break the glass cover on your heart, and there's no fixing that. This brief piece of a poem by Rumi, interpreted by Coleman Barks, evokes for me the ninth plague, the plague of darkness, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, our own darkness, our own hearts. yud heh -Bab -Heh said to Moshe, stretch out your hand towards the heavens, and there will be darkness over the land of Egypt and the darkness will intensify, or alternatively, a darkness that will be palpable. And Moshe stretched out his hand towards the heavens, and there was a thick darkness over the entire land of Egypt for three days. No man could see his brother, and no one rose from his place for three days. This darkness is darker than the darkness of the darkest night. No one could see anyone else. No one could even get up. All were in a state of paralysis. And of course, blindness is a metaphor, a metaphor for death, a metaphor for despair, corruption, malice, greed, egocentricity and confusion. During those days of intensifying darkness, what were the Egyptians feeling? I can only imagine the terror in their hearts. Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch describes it as the most complete, comprehensive literal suffering. 
it meant that each person was held, chained and fast, fastened to the spot where he happened to be. One could not see even their own kin, their own brother. Clearly, this means that no one could see, no one could know, no one could acknowledge the other, the alien, the widow, the orphan, the stranger in their midst. Who do we not see? Who would we prefer not to see? The person who pushes our buttons? The senator from the other party? <laughs> Innocent children in the midst of a bloody civil war or famine halfway across the world. The homeless person down the street. And who does not see you? Who does not see me? This darkness so thick, intense, and impenetrable. And yet we learn in several places in Zohar that there is no light except that which issues from darkness. And Rumi teaches that darkness is our candle. I admit to some confusion about this, and perhaps some resistance, really. Because I'm not talking about the darkness of the Egyptians, I mean our own darkness, as individuals, as a Jewish people, as nations, as the global community, as the earth, and all that dwells with and upon her. When will our eyes be opened? How long will we be held chained to wherever we are? And our blindness to our own needs that we cannot or will not respond to, or our own helplessness, in the face of these needs. I wonder, I wonder if Rumi, in describing breaking the glass cover on our heart, is speaking of the essential circumcision of the heart, which is necessary to receive God completely and to serve God completely. Is Rumi cautioning against creating so much openness that it is unsafe? The Kapska Rebbe teaches that there is nothing as whole as a broken heart. First, the coverings over the heart must be broken. I have experienced that darkness and that shattered, broken heart. Today, I am fully the candle that emerged from the darkness. I'm grateful to the many of you here and everywhere in all of the worlds who made that possible. Rumi teaches your boundaries are your quest. This is the exodus from Egypt, from its rhyme, from the narrow places that we remember and we experience over and over throughout our lives. Today, 1-13-13, as the Gamatria teaches us, oneness, two doses of love and the ineffable name of God as yud heh vav -Hey. May we all go forth with and in the light of love, illuminating the dark places and gently opening hearts.
will need wise thinking. How tender are these, our hearts, yearning for connection, and yet so often constricted. Pouring through a collection of music beloved to our Reb Zolman, I came upon a Chabad melody, the Benoni Nigun, that has become musical medicine for me, awakening my own yearning to love more deeply, to act more righteously, and to turn again and again and again to God. May the journey of this melody, this niggin, help all of us tap the inner well of our yearning for liberation from the illusion of our separateness and liberation from the systems of oppression wreaking havoc on our world and in our lives. For it's our yearning that brings us out of our constriction and closer to God, to every interdependent dimension, one manifestation, and luscious liminality of the one, the oneness of all that is. Oh, I'm 
Puppet fish color. You already had the snuff inside. And he was in the cemetery crying. And there was this goat that came over and said, Tell me, why are you crying? He says, I lost my little tabi fish color. So the goat bent down and said, Cut off a piece of my horn and make for yourself a new tabi fish color. So he did. And this guy now had this beautiful little box, and every time he offers someone <laughs> a snuff, he said, Oh, oh, Tom got it. <laughs> Such an amazing snuff. Where do you get the snuff? He says, it's just plain snuff, but there's the topic fish color. <laughs> so there was a run on the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody wanted to have a stickle of the horn of the goat. Because the horns went all the way up to heaven and they smelled so good from that. And Tom got it. But now it happens that the poor goat has very short horns <laughs> and there is no one there to hold up the sky. I want to say this has been the, the bearable trouble for rabbis. There are people who consider rabbis employees, which means that they can give, they can tell the rabbi how he should be running the show like a business. And I keep saying to them, yes, like a business, but do you know what kind of business a shul is in? <laughs> a shul is in a business to be able to create connections between God and people. And that's going to change. It used to be in the 50s that you would get a great architect to build you a shul because people saw it that way. Not happening this way anymore. I suggested to someone that this wonderful, beautiful building in New York, Temple Emmanuel, near Central Park, should create just like some churches have done. Bring in concerts. How wonderful it would be to have Bloch Sacred Service performed in Temple Emmanuel and all the other things that Bindra and the other people wrote. Because the Stiebel notion has made Judaism very small, very, very... It's not like the Benini. You think the Benini, then you go to other places. But most of the time the music is, it could be higher. It could be richer. I would like to see that ushers in the entrance should ask people, if you want to talk, stay out. But if you want to go and meditate inside, come on inside. And I would like to see, like we did in the Havara in Boston, way, way back in 68, 69, that when there was a change of season, we played the, from the seasons of Vivaldi. Yam pam pai da da da, da da yam pam pai da da We danced to that. It was wonderful. Because we need to lift it up a little bit. Because the seating has gotten very low because of all the crazy demands that were put on rabbis, become fundraisers. When you ask a rabbi, questions asked, how much time have you got to study Torah? Not for sermons, but just for yourself. This is important. There's some things that you can take and help your rabbi. He shouldn't be the one, she shouldn't be the one to set up the chairs. <laughs> People come some when we used to be in uh, Fellowship House Farm to do those retreats. And people would want to come and greet me and I was schlepping chairs. <laughs> and I was saying, I'm sorry, the, uh, you're, the shun is right now. Wait until the rabbi comes. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And so I want to say, if you can help out and be shamosin, you'll have rabbis. And if not, you're going to grind them down. With all this wonderful, wonderful, hopeful, rich statement that you have made about how you want to serve and what brought you to serve. And what you didn't say, but I could feel, was that you're willing to give a lot of love to people who will come and bow with you and will come and want you to teach them. But it's going to dry up. As they say, as much as the calf wants to drink, the cow wants to give. And I don't want your generosity to dry up because people haven't ac accessed that which you're really for as rabbi. So, I want to ask you, are you willing to help out? Are you are now witnesses? Are you willing to help out the rabbis? And if you're not Jewish, the clergy in your, in your parish, in your community, to help them out to be able to spend some time attuning to God and to spirituality and not to have to dry up. Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Again. Yes. Yes. All right, it's a little better. Not all so good. The horns are still too short. <laughs> yes. A lot better. You think that song that you should have a wonderful rabbit together with all your colleagues? Amen. Amen. By side them, I'll confess to Sharim, the Aviat Chemelai. I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. Kimi goi gadol, asher lo Elohim krovim elav, ki yah loheinu bechol koreinu elav. For who else is such a great nation that has God so near to it as Yah our God in all our calling? We are the people called from the slavery of Egypt, carried on the wings of Shekhinah, to be among those in this world who witness to the presence of the divine in this world. According to Pirkei Avot, Moshe received Torah at Sinai and transmitted it to Yahushua, who in turn transmitted Torah to the elders, who transmitted Torah to the prophets, who in turn transmitted it to the men of the great assembly. Over time, this linear transmission the laying on of hands, smicha, from one generation of men to another, became diffused as we wandered, spread out over the world, and as the number of our teachers who nourished disciples grew. For many, being a rabbi eventually became a degree, a measure of the intellectual mastery of a body of material, which in turn conferred power and authority. For us, being ordained, being a rabbi, being a chazan, being a rabbinic pastor, acknowledges belonging to a lineage and expresses a willingness to serve others as a model and guide of spiritual practice and development in this moment of a great shifting of paradigms. Today, we welcome our latest initiates <coughs> into this new lineage of Jewish spiritual renewal, drawing deeply on the wisdom of those who have preceded us, and particularly on the devotional mystics of Eastern European Hasidism. This lineage, given first expression and form by our beloved Reb Zalman Shachar Shalom. Now, in our time, we lay the hands of smicha, of trust and confidence, on both women and men equally, with loving respect for multiple possibilities of sexual orientation and life choices. This is in keeping with our commitment to voluntary negotiation with the dynamic, ever-fluctuating balance between individual practice and communal cohesion. According to the lineage of Pirkei Imahot, 
I know that I actually cry each time I say this. Miriam received Torah at Sinai and passed it to Mahla, Noah, Kagla, Milka, and Tirza, the daughters of Tzalafka, who passed it to Devorah, who gave it to Hana, who passed it to Michal, Achabu, eventually received Riburia and transmitted to Hana Rachel of Udemeria, Regina Jonas of Berlin, and now surfacing again to walk side by side and share the light equally with the parallel lineage of men with which we began. We are humbly grateful for this moment of living in the fulfillment of our age-old dream. May the light of the moon be like the light of the sun and like the rays, the light of the seven days of creation. Amen. Amen. May the lights of men and women in all their multiple, varied, and wonderful forms as rabbis, chazanim, rabbinic pastors grow ever stronger in the bond of open partnership and service to the one. Amen. 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 Beautiful friends, <coughs> we call those of you who step forward into our lineage as Rubinic pastors, Patrice Spitz, Larissa Blechman, Sandra Wartell, to come and stand before us. Taking a few steps forward, leaving some room behind you for those hands into which you will lean. We call the members of our God to come and stand behind you, joined by those who have been specifically requested to join our Lusmachot as beloved mentors and teachers. Herewith we ordain you 
to serve as spiritual companions, to study and teach Torah to God's people, to minister to them, to support and counsel them in the ways of Torah and peace, to console them in their bereavements, and to rejoice with them in their joyous occasions. We hereby empower you to follow the advice of competent rabbis and to serve as emissaries in all kinds of rabbinic actions. Thus, may your heart be in harmony with ours, may your word be in harmony with our word, your blessing as potent as our blessings. May it be God's will that you will be blessed with great success and that God will reward you with robust health of body and enlightened spirit. Thus will we fulfill you, you the promise, in order that your days and the days of your children be many on this earth, that God has promised to your parents that so that you might live heavenly days right here on this earth. As we call you, <laughs> so in a moment to be, Fazan surely dies permanent. Inviting at this time also those special mentors and teachers whom she has requested to stand by her at this time to come up and gather. <laughs> the hardest thing for a rabbi is to learn how to follow. B'shem <laughs> Our voice, 
your song our song, your prayers our prayers, your brachot our bracha. May the one who gives blessing be blessed. <laughs> Patrice 
May God shine the light of God's face upon you and be gracious to you. May God shine the light of God's face upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift God's face towards you and grant you peace. May God lift God's face towards you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.